Well, uh, I'm not even going to comment about the radiation issue because it's becoming a non-issue as time goes on. Um, <laughs> So in the last uh, 15 minutes, I'm going to talk about cardiac CT. And I also am not going to bore you with a lot of technical aspects of CT, because frankly, there are a lot of issues that arise that we do in terms of imaging patients. But I'm going to talk about how we can utilize CT. And, and obviously, one of the most common reasons is for de detecting coronary artery stenosis, uh, native uh, vessel disease, bypass grafts, patency of stents, et cetera. But you know, one area that's overlooked is the issue, importance of structural heart disease. And we can detect coronary anomalies. We can evaluate newly diagnosed uh, con, uh, systolic heart failure, quantify assessment of RV function and morphology, assess congenital heart disease. Dr. Lynn knows quite well about that. Uh, evaluate native uh, prosthetic valves, cardiac masses when you have inadequate images by other techniques. Uh, evaluate pericardial anatomy, evaluation of PV anatomy prior to AFib ablation, coronary vein mapping prior to biventricular pacing, assessment of myocardial viability prior to revascularization, and uh, also evaluate uh, vascular structures such as the aorta. So there's a lot of ways in which you can use uh, CT. Now, CT can be done both as a contrast and non-contrast study. This is an example of a 52-year-old man with exertional shortness of breath, no other symptoms. He had hyperlipidemia with an LDL of 133. He had a calcium score. This is the most common thing we do in, in mildly symptomatic or asymptomatic patients to look for evidence of, of plaque. A calcium score of zero is normal. Anything above zero means you have atherosclerotic disease. This is a moderate score of 224. This just happens to be this patient's a CT angiogram. Uh, which was performed because the patient was symptomatic, which is why we do CT in symptomatic patients. And this is both shots. And you can see that this patient had extensive plaque. And you don't just see a luminogram. You actually see the wall. So this is all plaque, non-calcified plaque in the, in the wall, as well as calcified plaque. And you're able to quantify the, the, the extent of stenosis. So very, very helpful technique. And... Um, as far as accuracy, there are, there are many studies showing, and I, I can't even go through all the data because there's like hundreds of studies with calcium scoring, but this is probably the most uh, representative, the MESA study in over 6,000 patients, showing that if you're asymptomatic and you have a calcium score of zero, basically you have no events, and events increase with increasing calcium score, and particularly if you have a score over 300 to 400, where event rates increase in terms of death and MI and any cardiac event. And again, remember that these are asymptomatic patients over a relatively short time period having these major events if they have severe calcium scores. So calcium scoring has become very good technique in evaluation of the asymptomatic individual. CTA is also very helpful in the evaluation of symptomatic individuals for coronary disease. So this is a study confirmed in 24,000 patients who had CTA. And you can see the increase in event rates as you go from normal coronary arteries to non-obstructive disease to single, double, and triple vessel disease. And obviously, mortality increased significantly based on the presence and extent of disease. So we use CT very commonly to assess risk and determine uh, who would might, be, for instance, be uh, appropriate for having invasive coronary angiography. Now, let's talk about some, uh, uh, some cases in which we can use CT. So CT in the evaluation of CHF etiology. This was a 45-year-old uh, woman with diabetes, multiple risk factors, who was admitted for evaluation. She actually had a nuclear study, and you can see she has a small anterior defect here, which seems to improve on rest imaging. Uh, unfortunately, the patient also had what appeared to be uh, breast attenuation, and that's shown by this shadow here going over the heart. That's a breast shadow. And so when you have situations like that, it then becomes kind of a, a difficult, unless you use attenuation correction, is this real or is this not? Her ejection fraction was not normal. As you can see here, her ejection fraction at rest was, uh, at post-stress, I'm sorry, was 36%. And at rest, it was... Uh, it was uh, 45%. And because of that, we sent her for a CT for better clarification. These are our coronary arteries. This is the LED. This is the circumflex. This is the right. Absolutely, completely normal. No evidence of obstructive disease whatsoever. Calcium score was also zero. This is looking at her ejection fraction. It was mildly reduced. We almost got the exact same number by CT as we got by nuclear. 
And so you can very nicely assess these patients. And this patient was diagnosed as having non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. Uh, in terms of looking at the ejection fraction, not only can you look at the left ventricular ejection fraction, you can also look at the right. This is a patient with severe right ventricular dysfunction uh, with fairly well-preserved uh, left ventricular dysfunction. We can also look uh, at bypass graphs. This is uh, someone who had prior bypass surgery. We can see the Lima graph. This patient has uh, SVG to the diagonal and SVG to the circumflex, which is occluded, as well as an SVG to the right, which was occluded. This is looking at a particular patient with an SVG to the right. You can see the clarity that you can see with looking at it with CT. You'll notice also that this patient had a stent in the, uh, in the right coronary artery graft. And this is the graph by angiography. And you can see that uh, not, this patient also has significant lesions in this graph, which were also shown in the exact same places by angiography. So a very good technique for evaluating patients. What about patients with a suspected coronary anomalies? This is an individual, if I can get this up, I don't know if I can. Next, okay, this is a patient who came in with chest pain. You can see that the left main comes off the right sinus of Alsalva and tracks down the anterior wall. Um, this just shows the anatomy. This is a 3D rendered view, again, showing the same thing. And uh, you can see where the left main comes off the right sinus and tracks between the pulmonary artery and the aorta, which is considered a, a significant finding and, a, and one of the reasons for doing bypass surgery in, in patients who then might also have underlying myocardial ischemia. This is another way in which we can use CT for assessing cardiac morphology. This was a 71-year-old man with chest pain. You can see that he does have placking and calcium in the uh, right coronary artery as well as the LAD, but non-obstructive disease, non-obstructive disease and aramis. You can see non-calcified plaque as well as calcified plaque. But more importantly, this patient had something else. He had this huge uh, membranous VSD, which you can see both here and here. And this is the uh, membranous VSD. This is the aortic valve. This is the communication with the right ventricle. So we can pick up... Uh, uh, structural abnormalities in the myocardium very nicely with CT. This is a patient who also uh, was evaluated for mor morphology, a 75-year-old man who had CAD or recent MI and heart failure. You already notice something going on here in the pericardium and here and here. And this patient had a huge uh, pseudoaneurysm. He blew out his lateral wall and, uh, and uh, CT picked this up and the patient went for surgery. So we had a rupture, uh, myocardial rupture, or pseudoaneurysm, and you can actually uh, gate these studies. You can see this is another patient with, again, a huge pseudoaneurysm, instead this time involving the inferior wall. This is the left ventricle, this is the pseudoaneurysm. This is a patient uh, who also uh, came in. Uh, this patient was a patient of mine, a recent MI and shortness of breath. She had a CT. I think you can see in the right coronary artery there is a stent, and it's a patent stent, so we can assess stents very nicely. And, uh, but she had something else, and she had this. And this actually turned out to be a, a left atrial myxoma, which uh, she ultimately went for, uh, for resection. And, and I don't have time to show you a lot of uh, cases in terms of masses, but we pick up masses all the time with CT and, and can use tissue characterization to determine uh, what those masses are. We can also assess congenital heart disease. This was a patient of mine who had uh, chest pain as well as congenital heart disease. You can see here, this is the aorta. And this is the pulmonary artery. Well, normally the, the aorta is down here and the pulmonary artery is up here. Okay, so this is kind of an abnormal relationship. And the other thing you'll notice is that uh, this is the left atrium, this is the right ventricle, and this is the aorta. So this patient actually had corrected transposition of the great vessels. And uh, we commonly do CT in patients with, uh, with complicated... Um, uh, congenital heart disease to find out the structural relationships uh, very nicely with the use of this technique. We can also look at valves. This is a patient actually had a bicuspid valve. You can see this is a two leaflet valve. This is in diastole. This is in systole. This patient had no evidence of uh, aortic regurgitation. The valve comes together nicely. This patient actually also had no evidence of stenosis. We can planimeter these valves and see what the valve area is. Uh, but you can see this is uh, an abnormal valve. This is what a typical 
valve should look like. It should look like a tri-leaflet valve as shown here. You can see the difference between the bicuspid and a normal tricuspid valve. Uh, this is a patient who actually went uh, for CTA prior to a surgical procedure. Can anyone guess what that procedure was? This patient had a huge ascending thoracic aortic aneurysm of uh, 65 millimeters, and, uh, but she had something else. And if you look by echo, she actually had severe aortic regurgitation. And as I said, by CT, we can also look at that. You can see when the, in diastole that there's a, there's a huge hole here. In fact, this planimetered out to 0.75 uh, centimeters squared, which over 0.3 is considered a, a, a severe uh, valvular leak. So this patient uh, had severe AI, and that was seen by echo as well as seen by uh, CT, as well as looking at this patient's coronaries prior to surgery, which were completely normal. Uh, we can also assess prosthetic valves. So this is a, an example of a patient who, um, let's see if we can get this going. Let's see. There we go. Okay, so this is a St. Jude valve. It's actually working quite normally. It's opening and closing nicely and cystly, but you'll notice something very strange about this, and maybe you won't. Okay, here it is. So here you see the annulus, and you see tissue. Here you see the annulus, the valve, and they, you have this big space. So this is a huge paravalvular leak uh, causing severe aortic regurgitation. So this is valve dehiscence. And uh, again, this is something we can nicely pick up with, uh, with CT. This is also a patient who was post-valve uh, replacement and uh, was having shortness of breath. And you can see the problem here now is that the leaflet is stuck. Okay, so it's not moving normally. And uh, you can also see it in this view, I think. Let's see. You can see it in this view. But there's something else that's, that's kind of unusual about this patient. You'll notice that this is the aorta. This is the valve. There's this apparent abnormality here. And then it goes beyond the valve. And it goes into the right ventricle and also the left ventricle. Okay? And so this was actually a very interesting case. It was a case of, if I can get it to go forward here. Okay, this was a case of a patient with a prosthetic uh, valve endocarditis who had an aortic root uh, pseudoaneurysm with RV perforation and also severe uh, aortic insufficiency. And so you can see that very nicely here. And you can see here the aortic root where the, you have a pseudoaneurysm of the aortic root. You have communication with the right ventricle and communication with the left ventricle. And this patient went for obviously extensive repair of this. Uh, we can also evaluate patients uh, after LVAD placement. And this patient, for instance, was a patient who had uh, a recent stroke after having an LVAD placement. We can look at the placement of the, uh, of the outflow, of the inflow cannula. Uh, it should be actually pointing more toward the uh, inflow track rather than the outflow track. This is, this is fairly reasonable positioning here. This is the, uh, out this is the uh, outflow track. You can see the communication with the uh, aorta uh, from the pump. Uh, this through this line, and uh, you'll also notice something here. This is a marked uh, uh, thrombus in the in the uh, left sinus of Alsalva, and so this was the reason why this patient had a stroke. And we commonly can pick up all kinds of clots within the drive lines, uh, within the aorta, in the sinuses, etc. When we evaluate these patients with LVADs, so. Uh, this is a patient uh, who had uh, CT prior to uh, atrial fibrillation ablation procedure. Uh, now, this patient also had a history of uh, both uh, aortic and mitral valve prostheses, and you can see how nicely you can see the aortic valve prosthesis. Notice the tissue here and the tissue here. So this patient had no evidence of dehiscence, okay? There's no evidence of, uh, of a paravalvular leak. We can also see in this view a look at the mitral valve. And you look how beautiful that is. And again, you can see the tissue of the annulus here, the tissue of the annulus here, no paravalvular leak, normal uh, uh, systolic and, and diastolic function of the valve leaflets. <coughs> but this patient also had uh, significant calcification and had some evidence of, uh, of um, restrictive uh, uh, cardiomyopathy. And this patient also had, uh, when we looked at the scan, this is the initial study and this is the delayed study. You'll see this area in here in the left atrial appendage. This is thrombus. 
And usually what we do when we do a, a first study and we see evidence of uh, non-filling of the left atrial appendage, we do a two-minute delay to make sure there's complete filling of contrast within the appendage. So this clearly is thrombus, and this has extremely high sensitivity and specificity for picking up clot prior to what this was going to be was a, was a uh, 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 AFib ablation procedure. This is another patient who had actually an AFib ablation procedure and came in with severe shortness of breath. And what you see here is severe pulmonary vein stenosis, which is a known complication of AFib ablation procedures in all of these pulmonary veins. And this patient actually had to go for stenting of all of these pulmonary veins. This is uh, an 85-year-old patient who was going for an EP procedure, and lo and behold, uh, not only was she uh, being assessed for a, a possible clot in the left atrial appendage, but she also had a, had a large atrial septal defect. This is the left atrium. This is the right atrium. You see this big hole here. This is a large secundum ASD. Uh, this is a patient who was going for a surgical procedure, and we were going to do a CTA on, but on him, but he only had a systolic blood pressure of 100 and a heart rate of 100. And when the heart rate and the blood pressure are equal, we get really kind of scared about, uh, about giving people beta blockers and evaluating them because we think they'll get even more hypotensive. And this patient actually uh, went for a non-contrast study, and lo and behold, he had a large uh, pericardial effusion. And so thank God we never did give him contrast or or did anything else. But by CT, you can pick up pericardial effusions very readily, both with and without uh, need of contrast. The other thing I'd like to say in the last minute is that we also use CT to evaluate for uh, valvular TAVR procedures, uh, trans aortic valvular replacement. Uh, we get very nice pictures of the body. And in fact, we can look at the whole aorta and the, and the, uh, and the extremity vessels. These are all isotropic 3D uh, rendered images. We get to see not only the lumen like you see with MR, but you also get to see actually the arterial wall and the components of the arterial wall in terms of calcium and, and non-calcified plaque, as you can see in all of these. And you can measure them very nicely in terms of lumens. And one of the most important aspects of CT is being able to identify the size of the annulus, recognizing that the annulus tends to be very eccentric in size. And so we measure the, the long and short axes as well as planimeter the annulus for more precise uh, TAVR placements. We can also assess the uh, aorta. This is a patient on a non-contrast study who had this large uh, descending thoracic aorta. When we gave him contrast, you can see that this is the contrast in the lumen. This is a large mural thrombus. So we can pick up aneurysms very nicely with CT. And we can also pick up other things, such as aortic dissection. And we can look at dissection. I have a really, I had a, some really nice shots of moving dissections in systole and di diastole in terms of the flaps. But this is a nice dissection flap. This is, a, this is a, the normal aorta. And this is the uh, false lumen. And this is clot within the false lumen. So in summary, there are many ways in which we can use CT. Uh, obviously, we can look at the coronary arteries in a very, very nice categorical fashion. But besides that, uh, we can assess uh, cardiac anatomy and cardiac function, cardiac valves, both native and prosthetic, tumors, pericardial disease, uh, pulmonary veins, and thrombus, et cetera. And uh, it is a very robust technique, which actually now, if, uh, when we get our new force system, will give less than one millisievert of radiation. Thank you.